Strangely enough, in, up in Walthamstow, uh, at a girls' school, when we both wanted to be watching Wales playing football on TV. And we came out, and uh, it was extraordinary, because on that street, everybody was pointing things up at the sky. I thought, there's some weird ritual going on here. And what I realized was a huge rainbow over, over London. It was spectacular. It was the kind of thing you, you, you catch in the film in the sense that, that journeys do make something happen. And um, the journey around the overground made something happen. I don't know what. The journey that we glimpse in the film where Andrew Kotick and his troop are walking with the bridal costume and all that, we undertook a walk from Waltham Abbey to the site of Battle Abbey, just at the time that the Euro referendum was happening. And the sense as you went, went down through South London and Kent, all these vote leaves, you know, you, you realize that the walk is actually always either an attempt to exorcise what's going on or to reinforce what's going on, but it, is, it isn't just a ramble. And I think, I don't know what the outcome of this film version is, but the film version, as you could say at the end, is a return to the Homeric voyage, a kind of return to the familiar ground, the glimpses of Hackney and all of that. And the great thing for me is to see all these people who are prepared to come along and, and join the tour and the miraculous way that you chased around with your camera and, and made some kind of sense of it. So if you take the words out, you kind of step up the music, get nice spaces, <laughs> it might make a good film. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's great. Is that a compliment? I'm not sure. <laughs> it's, it, the strange thing for me was when I was editing it, there was one thing that was sh I was certain of is that the straw bear, which is the first thing we shot, was the straw bear at the Old Kent Road, which is just extraordinary in a way. I mean, just watching people's reactions was just... So sort of amazing. Um, but I knew that would go at the end. And I was looking at the rushes. Normally, <clears throat> I, worked on a, I worked on a project once uh, in, in a day job I had. And it had over, I think Sarah actually is probably the only person I know has seen this film actually. Um, and it, I think in the end there were 300 hours of footage and they still couldn't get a cut. I mean, I had a go at it when it had 140 hours. And still, no one knew what it was. I mean, we don't know what this is about. It's not about anything. And it can, every version of it, everyone, no, that's rubbish. Keep shooting, keep shooting. Whereas this, I think we've got something like, I don't know, actually, to be honest, it shows you how slack my logging is, about less than 20 hours of, of, of footage, or maybe around 20 hours, which in modern digital terms is nothing for an 83 minute film. Um, but I could have used any of it. And so I remember the sort of like a month ago, it's amazing to see here now, a month ago, and the cut, I kid you not, uh, was, was five and a half hours long. And I went, oh, this is going to be tough. How do I get this down? And you there's too many words in that version. I think you're right. <laughs> in, a, in, a strange, in a very strange sense, um, the thing that defined the book for me, and I never know really how these books are going to, how I'm going to get out of them. Essentially, when you create a book in that way, you're creating a kind of labyrinth of words, and um, there's got to be a way out. And the, the way out in this was, was quite harsh, was this accident that Andrew Cotting had on the Old Kent Road. And we had, early on in the walk, we passed that very spot. And he, he pointed it out to me um, as being the very significant point where he always turned and made a special journey to go back to the places that he had lived in before he left London to go and live on the south coast. And, and then at the end, um, he, the film, the walk is done and he's, he's returning to the south coast <coughs> and he has this horrendous accident and he loses all memory for this number of days. And I realized that that really, strangely, was what defined the whole book. And so I took out the first chapters I'd written, which were all set around here, and were very grounded, uh, sort of stuff we saw early on in the film with, with Bill Parry Davis. Good stuff, but it wasn't, it wasn't part of this movement. And the movement became like the dream that Andrew Cotting has when he's in that sense of um, submergence into this molasses of memory. And, and that nice remark that you have of his at the, early on in the film about putting his fingers in his ears to keep out the noise of memory, because the noise of memory is so absolute. So essentially what my book became was, was Andrew Cotting's um, anaesthetized posthumous dream. And, and in a way, I think you've kind of got to the same point in, in the, the film as well, because you glimpse the bear, you see the bear for the first time in sort of Brompton Cemetery. 
and, and then it actually has a logic that it ends up with that moment. So somehow, those kind of collisions are really what define the city and how we deal with them. This, the whole film is a series of these small collisions, reveries, epiphanies, um, seeing uh, Marcia on the roof in Kentish Town, the kind of vision of the roofs, but citing the moment of punk, citing darkness. Um, Kathy Unsworth, as, of course I didn't see either of those episodes being filmed out in, in Shepherd's Bush, um, drifting through the market, finding the, the kind of traces of the sex pistols or whatever. All, all of those things would, would suggest a city that you could have added to, added to, added to forever, but it, it needed something human and dramatic to rescue it and make it into a story. Mm. Yeah, it's a strange, um, it's a strange experience. I was reflecting. I did, I did a, I did a strange talk. Uh, what day is today? Saturday. I did a strange talk Thursday uh, on a soapbox in a food market in the New King's Cross. And uh, you know, what do you talk about in that situation? And I was reading from my from my book, This Other London, and I thought oh, I'll read a bit about the Penton Mount, which of course is you know is, is mentioned in the film there. And I was sort of saying to me, really, there's that experience when you walk, when you walk streets, particularly if you walk them continuously, you kind of, you, you, you know, if you, you, know you, you annotate them in a way with, with memory and with association, but you kind of leave it there. And I've walked those same streets between the, the top of the Penton Mount and the South Bank every day for about four and a half years. And whenever I walk there now, I can't, it's like I'm being heckled by former memories. I can't walk those streets, I can't actually form any new, because all this stuff is just like, bombards me and it's it's there isn't it and that's why when I was editing particularly the night walk because there were audio is difficult in this situation as well and that sort of particularly when I had sort of two sources of audio you've got to find the, the principles and then find the other bit and then sync it up and so and then I was just chucking stuff down and uh, and I thought I'd sort it out afterwards and then actually some of this kind of sort of Barosian like cut ups which I learned about in Graham Dunning's workshop Graham Dunning's here actually um, and uh, it was sort of, I thought, that's a, but it was all great stuff. Everything, and this is stuff I just picked visually. And sometimes I would just scroll through the audio files and just chuck stuff down. And everything I put down had something interesting and fascinating in it. And maybe you might, sometimes you're talking about Peru, and then you'd be talking about um, uh, when you went to the forest to meet Gary Snyder, and, and it was all, wow, this is, you know, I mean, literally, we could have done another 83 minute cut that didn't have any of that in it, and it would have been equally as fascinating. So kind of the interesting thing to do would be a kind of enormous cut up, you know, you know, um, just as an audio file, just to just to listen to. Because in a sense, you kind of you're listening to this, you drift in and out. There's a secondary movement, which is physical movement across landscape. So you've got kind of a, a cut up of London because you're not going in a logical way around London. You're jumping. Uh, the most important and significant thing for me is this, which you came on part of, was that Andrew Cotting and I, when this was all over, he wanted to prove that his leg had healed and the memory is healed, we walked around the whole journey around the oak ground at night rather than by day. Only this time, theoretically, we were not um, going to make any work of it. it was, I didn't have to keep a memory of it. It was just literally a walk and the city was so empty and so quiet. It wasn't the sort of sense we got in the film. But, it, but you know, after you'd gone, because you, you dropped off um, around <coughs> Hampstead, um, then, there were, then it was pretty pretty quiet, um, you know, th th it was like going, walking through other people's sleep, except for the fact that Andrew Cotting would keep finding books on the street and get me to write stuff in them and post them through people's doors. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from that, it was, and at the great moment, the, the real ultimate moment, which is not filmed at all, is that um, he arrived back at the hospital he'd been taken to after the accident in Denmark Hill. And which still kind of traumatized pain. And it was night when we walked in at one door. And I was horrified, really, that the hospital had no security. Here were these two shambling, sweating figures with huge rucksacks kind of arriving in this hospital unchallenged, wander all through the hospital corridors for half an hour or more, and emerge on the other side. And suddenly, dawn has come up, and it's light, as if we'd actually walked from night into day. And at that moment, he. Uh, he said, you know, he felt that he, the, the trauma, the pain that was in the body that he'd been through with all this experience was actually lifting. And by the time we came back down to the river and had some breakfast, he was, it was like it had worked. This experience was a sort of resurrection and allowed him 
through into the next project, which was plotting this warp that you've caught a few glimpses of, which was made in a very different spirit. So what one essentially cycles through into another all the time. And I think the film has got that sense. So, great. <laughs> Thank you. Should we, should we take some questions? Please. <laughs> Hi, it's a very simple one actually. It's um, in what ways, because it must have happened, you've got into trouble on any of these walks, whether it's security or maybe just a member of the public. <laughs> Give that to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah that, that, that's a kind of constant. And essentially, if you're not getting into trouble, you're not doing it right. Um, the, the, the last interesting clash I had, uh, I've mentioned this before because it was so bizarre. It was outside City Hall, where there are, where are those fountains and things. And I was, I was literally just talking to somebody. Um, it was, we, had, we had a very small mic, and the guy was asking me about the riverfront and stuff, and I was talking. And security came around and surrounded us as usual, and they said, you can't talk here. <laughs> <laughs> what? This is City Hall. This is, you know, I said, yes, yeah, I know, but this doesn't belong to City Hall. This belongs to more London. I said, how much more London can you get? <laughs> and this is just a, a slated grey area that belongs to whatever more London is, where these security people now control it. And you can't talk there, let alone film. I mean, you know, the, the battles of film, which I guess John must have had too, is that in certain areas of London, you, you're constantly being stopped and challenged. What was strange was that we, I don't think we ever really were. This guy, once in a graveyard was the only time somebody challenged during the course of this film. And so that makes me think we've moved on to a stage in the kind of paranoia of London where it doesn't really matter anymore. You know, people are not so concerned with that. At the, at the Olympic moment, there were endless challenges, people having cameras seized in the Lee Valley. I know someone forcibly had his, all his memories deleted, um, there, there were big battles going on there, but that doesn't seem to happen anymore. There's a sort of a, which makes it to me more sinister, because they don't care. You know, it's as if there's a sort of drone level above the ordinary CCTV level of security, which I know is only there to make the movie after the disaster has happened, so you can put together a good newsreel. Um, I don't know if there are any, uh, were there other challenges or anything no, with you? Fine. We were fine. Actually, when we filmed um, in Brompton Cemetery, I, I got there. That's when Andrew was in the straw bed in Brompton Cemetery. I thought, well, last time we filmed in the cemetery, we, that's the only time. That's why there's a there's quite a sort of like a jump cut in that where Ian and Chris are exiting the cemetery because I wanted to get the moment as close as I could. You see that guy catching up with us behind. He's sort of made, he's really determined to stop us filming, and so I thought, well, that was us just walking through the cemetery. Andrew's going to be just that straw bed. We'll definitely get busted. I thought we'll get a minute in, maybe, and we'll make sure we get the point where we start filming. And uh, no, and we were there for about an hour, and Andrew got dressed, and, done. and in the end, after the words, trying, the police came and they arrested someone. Still, nothing happened, and he was you know, liberty to do what like. I mean, my, my funniest encounter with that is because um, I sort of make little videos for YouTube where I just go out walking and shoot, <coughs> and shoot. And I was walking along the river, roading, and I got to Debden, and you can't. Uh, with, a, with a, you can't walk along the river anymore, and so the only way to walk, and it was dark basically, so I cut through this industrial estate in dark in the dark at Debden. And I quite like industrial <coughs> estate, so I was taking photographs and filming these warehouses and buildings, and there were sort of just normal buildings and warehouses. And then I got to one where suddenly there was like loads of, uh, of like 20 foot high razor wire. And there were CCTV cameras. I thought, my God, what on earth have they got in here? But compared to these other, I think there's a screw fix and uh, office supplies. <coughs> enormous security, or double fences and everything. So I was fascinated with it. So I started taking more photographs and filming more of it. And I got to the far end, because in the dark, I couldn't, I couldn't refine the footpath to get the river roading. I heard this lady going, excuse me, sir, are you, are you all right? Can I help you at all? And I went, oh, well, yeah, if you don't mind. So I told her exactly what I was doing. And she went, oh, by the way, can I... I suppose, I, could, I suppose you took the old photograph, did you, of the fence? I said, well, I, I did, I did, yeah, it's quite, quite a fence. 
She said, I suppose I can have a look, could I? And I said, uh, well, not really. She goes, it's only that that's the Bank of England's printing works. So you're not, <laughs> you're not that. And after then, we had a very long conversation. At the end of it, she went, do you know what? If, I'll show you where the footpath is, and it's just there. Go there, take as many photographs as you like. If you've got a long enough lens, you'll get the same shots. So, yeah, you're right, they have got to the point where they don't care. No, the, 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 the thickest uh, time of challenges was um, just before the millennium, it, when we were, I was doing the um, M25 project, there was a lot of, <laughs> a lot of challenges because all of the old asylums were being converted into uh, private housing at that time. And, and the, when there were security guards around, even in these completely empty and deserted buildings, there was a lot of toing and froing, and people were, were nervous and paranoid about that happening. So, so the, the weirdest thing on that trip was when I was filming with Chris Pettit and we found this bizarre <laughs> building we called a Sebald building, which was down um, in Staines, a, a modernist building of, of no obvious function. And we walked into it, you know, there's an office thing with cameras, everything. nobody took a blind bit of notice. We asked what's going on here, they said, oh, well, I can't really explain. Nobody could explain what it was, or what its function was. They, they let you film, and it was my first uh, impression of this new world that was post-surveillance. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was in 2000. And then again, around, around the whole Olympic era, there was again the whole step up in paranoia. And it moved from ordinary security guards to the Gurkhas, and you were know, being endlessly balanced. But then after that, as I say, we moved into some very curious moment when your challenges only come when you go into buildings, mostly now, or you actually try and access or buildings, you know, or obviously Canary Wharf still, yeah. But generally speaking, something strange and different is afoot. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Is that Dan? Sorry. Sorts of questions. Uh, uh, yeah, okay, so I, I can tell you about but my first book I read was Lights Out of Territory, and there's obviously a sort of streak of, kind of doom, I suppose, throughout all of your books, perhaps. But I guess uh, sort of Boris Johnson hangs over this film, and uh, uh, as a sort of portentous film, or even what you think about the future of London, you know, just... So uh, well, I tried to ask John that question in the film, and he, he didn't answer, or if he did, he didn't show me his answer. Boris Johnson did, did clearly hang, hang over the, the film as a, as a kind of spectre, and um, it's been quite shocking to see, to see him suddenly, after all these years, um, confronted by the kind of enormity of what he's actually done. He's become kind of ashen and shaken by the change that he's wrought in the world when he felt he was a bit like the straw bear. He was basically the straw bear of London and he blundered about in, in kind of ways that made him feel good and trampled much underfoot and then suddenly he's, he's stumbled across a funhouse mirror and seen his own reflection uh, and it's not good. Um, there, there's an episode that wasn't something in the film but it's, it's in the book comes right at the end of my uh, overground book, where I actually in encountered him at Old Street, and it was it was quite fascinating because he he such a news manager. He had arranged this huge crew of cameras and, and TV people were there waiting for him to appear, as if on his bike all alone. And he pops off and he does two minutes of the of his shtick, you know, on on the streets about how Old Street is the future and the there's a techno hub of the universe and all this stuff, and then he jumps on his bike and the shots all goes, he goes off into Old Street Roundabout, and a few lorry drivers are trying to run him over and so on. But <laughs> what's following him is an enormous cavalcade of gas-guzzling taxis and black vans and camera crews, so that the kind of eco-message he's been pumping out for the TV thing is, is completely undone by what you see physically happening. And that combination of uh, wonderful uh, street charisma hiding a kind of a mass of bullshit was what I felt sat quite nicely at the end of the book before we segued into uh, Andrew Cotting's hideous accident on the Old Kent Road. Um, he didn't 
physically he really manifest himself in, in the film very much, but I guess he he was a presence. I mean, it, which we I think the thing about the film that strikes me is that it's not happening really in contemporary London. It's happening in a kind of a, a place buffeted by the noise of memory. So. so um, both Andrew and I are remem remembering different eras and different parts of London, and so are most of the other people that are brought in. And you realize that is what London is, is this series of conflicting um, memories, desires, impressions, that all overlap each other and create this great wall of noise, great wave motions running through that push you along um, with all of the, the walkers in particular. Walking has been proved to be a, a useful way of, of tapping the radar and scouring. It's a kind of equivalent of um, scavenging along the river, which we saw some people doing, and picking up shards and trying to make a, a collage that makes some sense out of that, uh, as against the noise of all of the graffiti and the walls, that every space is over-narrated, every space is competitive. It's very hard to get breathing space in London. So I'm very I'm pleased when you get those tiny glimpses of strange dunes and hillocks and little little spots that have survived where these figures kind of draw breath and start to talk to each other rather than have to shout across the noise of the traffic. I, I, I kind of deliberately left it in as a question as well when you, there was a bit where Amy addresses me and says, you know, uh, what do you, what optimism do you say? And it was sort of like difficult because I was filming and I thought, well, I don't want to get involved, I'm not in this. I don't want to get involved in the Well, I am, yeah, yeah, yeah. I am. And uh, well, when I was editing, I thought, well, could I, can I find a way, could I find a way of working that in? But I thought, I wanted to leave it as a, as a question, but at the time, what I, what I said, and what I was going to include in the film, but there's just too much other material, is at the same time, I've, I've been doing a YouTube channel where I've been um, sort of documenting or, or help promote various kind of campaigns against development. And, um, you know, one of the things that has emerged, I think, under the challenge of the things you're talking about, this, this change, you know, the way that the, the, a key point in the film is the one that Bill makes quite early on about the way that the Dalston Junction development became a template for the development of the rest of London, where money was being raised by selling property off plan overseas, and that became the template for development because the banks wouldn't lend people money to build, etc., etc. But what this sort of onslaught has been. <coughs> on communities in London has been fought against. And that's one of the things that's emerged, is that people have suddenly, particularly when you see people fighting to say council estates and stuff, and because I grew up on a council estate, and you know, it's very much a kind of malign spaces. People didn't go there, it's something you were sort of slightly embarrassed of. And now council estates have become almost these kind of precious assets that everyone's fighting to save. And that, you know, it's a terrible thing, that, you know, it's, a, it's, it's a bad reason, that, you know, that, being uh, threatened, but it's great to have seen the response. I think we're seeing it as well, like today, because <laughs> people went out this morning and marched, you know, again. So I think that's sort of like the positive side of it. I mean, it is difficult. We, we, we well, talked well, about this for a year. It's difficult to be positive, isn't it? I'm, you know, con constantly asked if anything, if I saw anything positive that came out of the great wave of uh, grand projects and developments, and they all, always said, but the only positive that I saw in it was the quality of the opposition that it actually brought people together. And I talked about the kind of protests in Broadway Market, you know, people were prepared to occupy cafes all through the winter, and there was a re recurrence of a spirit I knew when I was first here in the 60s, when people were squatting, a lot of council properties were empty, a lot of big houses were just left to rot at that time, and there was a lot going on. But your answer now, I mean, I, I guess, is that this is to do with the quality of protest. Mm. And I'm, I'm saying I, I want, would like to find something that was, instead of protesting against, mm. was protesting for. You know, I think there's got to be a kind of imaginative leap. We, we've got that level that enough people can, can see what's wrong and enough people are gathered together to oppose it in, in various ways. But I'm looking for the, 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 the real big jump to, to people who've got a kind of a, uh, an imaginative sense of something beyond that, that created something new which um, I did see a lot in early days in Hackney and in, in London in the 1960s. There were people who came in, I mean, often uh, Dutch provers of people who had spectacular ideas that they, they didn't, they, they talked about, and I remember hearing one guy, he was very strong, and not, not, you, don't, you don't waste your energy um, protesting this and that and that because you don't win. It just kind of, in some ways, it just reinforces the status quo. 
you do something completely opposite and different. And he, he took me to a place <coughs> in uh, Angel Alley where they, they'd actually just created a whole dormitory and they were, they were feeding bunches of people who were just coming in off the streets and sleeping there. And they would, they would use space that was connected to the Whitechapel Gallery and play on the guilt of the gallerist to create this thing. And putting up tents on Hackney Marshes and London things. I mean, there, there, there were always imaginative things to do that were, that were beyond just the level of saying everything is bad, we oppose mm -hmm. it. And I, yeah, I would like to find those for myself. And that, in a, kind of, in a sense, I think that was my question to you. Because I'd been going on and on about, and we had the conversation with Bill Perry Davis and all that. And I thought, because I know you get around a lot, and you, you're a part of so many different movements. Was there something you'd seen that suggested a kind of a new way, or something interesting that was emerging and happening? Well, I mean, I, there, is, there isn't a simple answer to that, I don't think. Um, but one of the things, one of the, one of the most, I mean, there's been numbers, numerous inspiring campaigns. But uh, what I found interesting is the way, the, there's just a, a mood shift, I think, in the last, well, the last time I was on this stage, actually, was for the screening of Andrea Zimmerman's film, A State of Reverie, which was about the Haggerston Estate, and we had a discussion here. But I know that was sat roughly where Travis Elber is, and I called her out on it, and I said, and she said something, oh, yeah, but this, you've got to have in your manifesto, when Sid, well, with whoever stands for London Mayor, they've got to stand up and, and put in that they want, you know, at least 50% social housing in London, they want a rent cap, all these things, and everyone's calling. And you're seeing those ideas now becoming increasingly more mainstream. There's been a shift on that level, and there's, been a, there's a group called Reclaim London who've gone a bit quiet recently. And it's a group of various activists that have been involved in different campaigns who have pulled together amazing sort of expertise. And I think one of the first, and they're challenging, um, a lot of what's going on in London, not on just going out on the street and sort of shouting and waving placards, but really picking apart the kind of planning documents and finding all the gaps and the holes, because council planning departments are a bit shonky and they just wave stuff through. And these guys are going through and really just pulling it all apart and having quite a bit of success. And one of the first things that Sadiq Khan did in his first day in office was calling the Oz Court development, which was, you know, that's one of the big, that's the size of the Stratford development nearly. So things are moving forward, but actually in quite a dry, almost technical way, with people contesting these things in a very, by just looking at the depth of the detail, really. Uh, thing that, one of the things that, it's a very small scale, but one of the things that struck me most recently was this um, movement to create um, huts and things within development sites, secret ones. So you go down to, a, and this isn't happening in, right in the city of London, that, that during, during a big event like uh, the London Marathon, <laughs> a bunch of people go down and they just assemble a kind of builder's hut in the, in the middle of an area where you expect to find builder's huts. And the people have been living in it now for nine months. <laughs> and you just, you just paint it black. And, you have, and, and, those, and I think there's a whole network of these growing up around London. And they, you, they just don't see them because you expect there to be holes in the ground. You expect there to be huts everywhere. And even their own security are now protecting them because they think it's part of their own thing. <laughs> no more time left, but it's all obviously a discussion that is going to rage and well go on and on really as long as it as long as it continues to affect London. But uh, can we just have one more round of applause, please, for Ian Sinclair and John Rogers? Thank you very much.